Hamsters welcome you friends. Today is so will be devoted to the topic of induction heating. We will consider what it consists of, how to adjust the system so that nothing explodes and in the end we will test the capabilities of the device. The power of such an inverter can reach more than 2 kilowatts and the resulting temperature allows you to melt silver, copper, steel and other metals, the melting temperature of which does not exceed 1500 degrees. So make yourself comfortable, we begin. The device consists of several module blocks, which we will analyze now. The power parts of the device is the entire bridge of powerful MOS transistors. In this design it is IRFPS 37 and 50A, with an operating voltage of 500 volts and a current of 36 amperes. It turned out that this transistor doesn't have a fixing wall. So I had to think of exotic ways of fixing it with aluminum strips and bolts. We fix it tightly and don't forget to isolate the transistor case from the radiator with mica. In the end you should get a design in which all the connectors with power and control are conveniently located. To prevent the confusion you can put labels to everything. For the full bridge to work properly you need a control model. It is assembled on a separate board and contains a control pulse generator on the LR2153 chip. Amplifiers of these pulses assembled on MAX44 and 20 drivers and galvanic isolation for matching control signal levels. For smooth frequency adjustment, a 3590S multi-term precision resistor is used. A rough change in the frequency range is carried out using jumpers located on the board. The generator is powered from 12 volts. Such a voltage will obviously not be enough to power a full bridge, and that's why a powerful unit with an output voltage of 320 volts comes to the rescue. It is assembled in a case from a computer power supply model and has two power switches. If we look inside, we can see a powerful diode bridge, a block of electrolytic capacitors, a 60-watt bulb which, when applied, limits the current when charging capacitors and prevents the diode bridge from death. There is a small automation which, when a certain voltage across the capacitors is reached, turns off the light bulb and energizes the device directly from the 220 network. Now let's move on to the heating part. A spiral with a diameter of 50 mm, which contains 6 turns of a copper 4 mm tube, serves as an inductor. It will create a high frequency magnetic field, which will heat in the template. Capacitors that are parallel to the spiral has a total capacity of 1.7 microfarads. The block consists of 54 capacitors of 33 nano each. Such an amount is necessary so that they are less heated during operation. For these purposes, CBB81 capacitors are well suited. Another detail is a matching transformer, which is wound on two ferret rings connected together and contains 20 turns of MGTF wire with a cross section of 0.75 square. It is through it that we will transfer energy to the circuit. It also serves as a galvanic isolation. A current transformer is on the wires. It will help to judge on the resonance of the system. The device requires cooling, so we use copper pipes. As a pump that will drive water, we use an ink supply unit from a printer which we found at a local landfill. The principle of operation is simple. The engine drives the rollers that roll on rubber capillaries pushing the water forward. All this, considering of individual blocks, can be considered exhaustive. We connect the generator and the power bridge. We tighten the screws in the connectors as tight as possible. If during operation somewhere one wiring is not connected, all four transistors will burn in a bright flame accompanied by Hollywood special effects. 
For simplicity of use, all parts are located on a piece of plywood. We connect the wires with the power and the matching transformer. It is advisable to thin all ends before use. This will provide a more reliable contact. In general, we are not in a hurry and we are doing everything properly. Now we connect the coolant system. We coat all the tubes with waterproof silicone. The air conditioning system is ready for use. Before you start the infernal machine, it must be configured. First of all, after switching on, we check the supply voltage on the generator. It should be about 12 volts. Next, you need to select the resistance of the gate resistor. From this, we connect the Soviet variable resistor with a resistance of 47 ohms and turn on the oscilloscope. With a small resistance, there is a ringing, and with a large one, an ejection in the form of a needle appears. It is necessary to select the resistance so that the signal is smooth. We solder a constant resistor and move on. The bridge arms should work in turn, with a pause between inclusions. This pause is called dead time, which is 1.2 microseconds for the IR2153 chip. We turn the twist and observe how the generator frequency changes. The duration of the dead time should remain unchanged over the entire range of frequency adjustment. Then we connect the crocodile to the matching transformer and we hook the other to the current transformer. Let's try to heat a small steel rod. Set the voltage to 13 volts to start. When the voltage on the power supply changes, you can see how the amplitude on the oscilloscope signal changes proportionally. The resonance is turned by the changing the frequency from higher to lower. That is, at the time of switching on, the frequency must be obviously greater than the resonant one. With a decrease on the frequency of the master oscillator, the amplitude of the current signal will increase and its waveform will gradually transform from triangular to sinusoidal. We are approaching resonance. At the resonant frequency, the amplitude reaches its maximum, and the phase of the current coincides with the phase of the voltage. It becomes somewhat curved. If we pass over the resonance and continue to decrease the frequency of the master oscillator, then the amplitude of the current will begin to outstrip the phase of the voltage. We go into the so-called capacitive mode. At the fronts and sections of voltage impulses, high-frequency surges needles appear due to hard reverse recovery of bypass diodes. With these modes, the keys work in hard mode and get harder. We raise the bridge supply voltage to 30 volts. Let the inverter run for 20 to 30 minutes in this mode. The temperature of the radiators should not significantly exceed the ambient temperature. Also, there should be no sparks, twitches, breakdowns, etc. The metal rod inside the inductor heats up to redness in the first minute of operation. The resonant frequency is 89 kHz. If during melting the load is removed from the inductor, then with a hundred percent probability the power part of the bridge will fail due to the increase in current. You shouldn't turn the inductor at it. I wonder what voltage develops on the capacitors. The amplitude in this case fluctuates around 10 volts. We multiply it by 10 and get 100 volts of amplitude and the inductor in resonance mode when the bridge is powered by 30 volts. If you deform the spiral, the resonance will also go away. If you short one turn, then there will be a mess in the form of a blue curved snake. The adjustment can be considered comp. Turn off the device in the same sequence as when I turn it on. We test the inverted power on a steel bolt with a diameter of 12 mm. We turn on the first switch and charge the capacitors. Then we turn on the second switch, which supplies the bridge. Reduce the frequency on the master oscillator. We observe how the current grows. With one ampere of consumption, we stop the adjustment and leave the system to work for half an hour, while controlling the temperature wherever possible. At the same time, the iron thing heats up to the redness.
if nothing explodes in half an hour and the city did not lose lights due to the experiments, you can raise the current to 2 amperes. In the first seconds, everything worked perfectly until the coolant system made itself felt. The pressure generated by the pump was insufficient to pump the right amount of fluid. At some point, the temperature reached 300 degrees and the solder that connected the tubes began to melt. Boiling water immediately began to spray in all directions. It's a good luck that I managed to turn off the power to the bridge in time. Who knows how it would end? When checking it turned out that the compressor is able to pump only 2 liters of water per hour. This is a general failure. Since the coolant system was completely discouraged and it was decided to replace the pump from the printer with a motor from the window washer of the Soviet automobile industry. To control the fluid pressure, a voltage regulator on the LM317 stabilizer was made. For reliability, the joints of the tubes can be secured with ties. Turn off the power of the pump and adjust its strength. The metal will be heated in a graphite crucible originated in China. We put it in the inductor and set the current to 3 amperes. The maximum consumption of such a workpiece is 4 amperes. We observe how the crucible is heated. I wonder what will happen to silver. The weight of this piece is about 8 grams. We put it in a crucible and observe it. The melting was successful, which means that the temperature inside the crucible has reached just above 960 degrees. It is necessary to make a thermal box in order to gather more heat. The composition of sand and gypsum in a ratio of 1 to 1 will be the most reliable. Thoroughly mix of components of the refractory composition, put the mass into a container of a suitable size, and insert a workpiece close in diameter to the crucible into the inside. Until everything is tightly sized, we take out the blank and part of the thermos can be considered ready. In the same way, we make a lid that will cover everything. The conductor itself is best placed in the foam block, since it is quite easy to process and make the desired hole with channels, and the drawbacks can be easily modified with the file. A fabric of tepid will serve as an external heat insulator on the inductor. It can withstand temperatures of about 500 degrees after which it made like glass. The gypsum sand insulation crucible came out strong enough. We did not even expect this. We place this glass in the inductor. And now we can consider the thermal insulation system complete. We drive the crucible at half power for an hour to dry the gypsum glass. Now you can return to the smelting of copper, which failed the first time. We wait until the insulation burns out. For reliability, we cover everything with a lid. A minute later, an interesting picture was seen. Copper surrendered.
copper melted without any thaw, which means that inside the crucible the temperature is much higher than 1080 degrees. Let's try to put any ball inside and see what happens. When we took out the workpiece, it became immediately clear that it was deformed, which means that the steel began to melt and the temperature inside the crucible exceeded 1300 degrees. As a sign of this, the crucible began to spit sparks. After several melts, the gypsum lid cracked. It seems that it did not completely dry before use, and the insulation ball completely degraded, became brittle and began to crumble. For these purposes, it is better to take fire clay. It withstands up to 2000 degrees. After the eighth melt in the graphite crucible got somewhat thinner. The cost of the entire thing is about 90 bucks. About two months passed from the idea of assembling an inductor to the last voiced word in the film. As Japanese wisdom says, if the direction is chosen correctly, the speed of movement is not important. And that's all, it was hamster time. Don't subscribe to the channel, put dislikes. There you go.